I heard, let's make sure this is on. When I heard that they gave me the one on salvation, I was like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That's a very important one. <laughs> so salvation is the theme of the whole Bible. That is the purpose of why the New Testament was written and the Old Testament. That is why the Bible was written. And this doctrine, the, sal the, the doctrine of salvation, is the crowning doctrine of the 16 fundamental doctrines. It is what it's all about. It is the heart and soul of Christianity. So I'm going to share with you guys eight conditions for salvation. These are things that you don't have to understand to be saved, but it would be really good for you to eventually understand this is how salvation works, and this is how someone even becomes saved in the first place. So the first condition for salvation that you should understand is salvation is from God and not from man. So let's take a look at Luke 3.6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Luke 3, 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. It was sought by God the Father. It was bought by the Son. And it was wrought by the Spirit. Salvation was not human's idea. They did not come up with it. It was God's idea. For salvation. It was initiated by God the Father, bought by Jesus Christ, and brought down to us and available to us by the Holy Spirit. Humans had no part in making salvation available to the world because God chose to give it to us. God chose to give it to us. He initiated it. The second condition that you, would be great for you to understand about salvation is salvation is through Christ alone. Yes. Yes. Let's take a look at Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Not by a God, not by a higher power, not by Allah, not by spiritualism, it's by Christ. I had a friend I worked with and she, she said, oh, um, isn't the God of, of Islam and the God of, of Christianity the same thing? She's like, I'm not, I'm not a Christian, I'm spiritual. I just believe in a higher power. I'm like, you're not going to be saved by that. Even if you pray to a higher power every day, you will not be saved by that. Right. Spiritualism is not what you will be saved by. If you're at home and you, again, you just pray to some type of spiritual being and you don't really have a name for it, but you just think it's something there, that is not how you will be saved. It has to be through Christ. Through the accept, sec, accept excuse me, through the acceptance of Christ only shall we be saved. Jesus was the propitiation of our sins. So that's a long word. I think it's funny I messed up on acceptance, but I didn't mess up on propitiation. Um, the definition of propitiation is averting the wrath of God by giving a gift. So I said Jesus was the propitiation of our sins. So because Jesus died on the cross for us, he averted the wrath of God by giving himself. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices were the propitiation of the Israelite sins. And of all, yes, and Jesus was the sacrifice and the propitiation of all the world's sin for us. Let's take a look 
at 1 John 2.2. 2. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Not just for the ones who choose to accept it. He actually paid for everyone, but we have to accept it. Right. By Christ, we receive the atonement for our sins. Atonement has more of an emphasis on the individual receiving the covering of the sins by the sacrifice. So Jesus is the atonement, the atonement of our sins. The third condition that we should consider and understand for salvation is salvation is obtained by grace and not by works. So let's take a look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not by your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We cannot be saved by ourselves, by our good works. The same as there are people who pray to a higher power and think they will be saved. There are others who believe, well, if I'm just a good person, if I don't do major evil things like murder or commit adultery or steal, then I'm going to be okay. All the smaller sins, who cares, like lust or gossip or whatever. I mean, I'm doing those things, but kind of attitude. And it's, it's by my good works that I'm being saved. And that's not how it works. We all know that. We do not have to demonstrate good works before we can give our hearts to the Lord. We don't have to wash up before God showers us clean of our sins. We don't have to be put together to be saved. We don't have to figure out, oh, how am I going to fix my life? How am I going to have it all together? No, the Holy Spirit will get you through that. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom, will give you power to go through it. You don't have to fix yourself before you get saved. I think it can be wisdom to be ready, that I am ready to give everything up, but you don't have to give everything up before you're saved. This doctrine or this truth was one of the major reasons why people became Protestants and left the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church often emphasized works to maintain your salvation. You do not have to pay money to a priest to be saved when you're a Protestant. You don't have to go to confession to be saved. You don't have to have a priest bless you before you die to be saved. You don't have to be baptized when you're a baby to be saved. You don't have to do spiritual rituals to be saved. It is through grace, period. He already paid it all on the cross. The fourth condition to consider is that salvation is for the whole man. Let's take a look at Isaiah 53. 1 through 10. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the, the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. 
But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Verse 10. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his land. Salvation is not just to forgive our sins, but to cleanse you and to keep you. Salvation is not just to forgive your sins, but it is to cleanse you and to keep you. Sin brought death to our, our soul and our body, but salvation brings life to both. Salvation can bring healing to your physical body. There is, I want to emphasize verse uh, 5 in Isaiah. And it says, upon him was chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. His salvation, Jesus choosing to die on the cross and be whipped, he was trying to give us not only the opportunity to be saved and saved from hell, but also to be healed. Right. There are some denominations that don't believe that healing continues on today. There's some denominations that believe that it stopped at the book of Revelations. That that was it. That was it. When the, when the book closed, that healing closed as well, which blows me away. Because even, even the Catholics believe in healing. You know what I mean? It, it has existed for thousands of years of believing that healing is for today. And we, the Assemblies of God, is a denomination that believes that God heals today. We should not laugh about it. We shouldn't mock it when people pray to be healed. We should take it seriously. Because that was a part of the price that Jesus paid on the cross. As seriously as we take someone praying to be saved, we need to take it as seriously when someone's being prayed to be healed. Because the same way as we genuinely believe that person's being saved, we need to genuinely believe that person can be healed. It's a serious matter because Jesus died to save our whole body, to heal our whole body, and, and destroy all the works of death. All the works of death. And all the works of sin. The fifth condition that we need to consider is that salvation is for time and eternity. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And Hebrews 5, 9. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. God didn't just save you from your sins on earth, which would be a huge thing in of itself, to, to remove addictions and sickness and evil and people getting into things that they shouldn't. That'd be a huge thing in of itself if God just saved you from your sins on earth. 
But no, he saved you from your sins from all eternity and the consequences of the sin. And it's important to note that God removes the spiritual consequences of sin. There's some sin, like if someone commits murder, that God will forgive you and, and the spiritual consequences, you will no longer go to hell because of it, because you repented, but you will sometimes still have to deal with the earthly consequences of it. Yes. I've, I've seen some people who um, struggled with alcoholism and even though they quit and they, they gave their heart to the Lord and they no longer got into a drunken stupor, um, they still had to pay the physical consequences. Even though there are incredible miracles where God removes those consequences, sometimes it happens and they have to deal with the earthly consequences of their actions. But the Lord has forgiven them of the spiritual consequences. They, do, they will not have to go to hell for it. He has saved us from the guilt and penalty of sin for now and eternity. We no longer have the consequences of sin. Christ has cut off the power of death and took the consequences on himself so that we no longer owe an eternal death in hell. We no longer owe an eternal death in hell. Amen. We no longer owe an eternal death in hell. Amen. That's something we should celebrate. Amen. Something we should celebrate. This is ours. Uh, because of Christ, we no longer owe eternal death. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. This is amazing. Amen. Amen. The sixth condition that we need to consider is salvation is neglected at a fearful cost. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels pr proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape it if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While well, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Those who neglect so great a salvation has committed a grievous, everlasting mistake. It, it breaks my heart to know that so many people in America have heard about Jesus, yet they're intentionally denying him. And they're neglecting this great salvation at a grievous cost. At a grievous cost. They don't realize how precious of a gift, gift they're denying. Oh, they want to have their fun. They want to have their time to party, how, time to sleep around. while Christ died on the cross to give us this precious gift. To deny this precious gift is to take on the consequences of your sin and experience eternal damnation. An eternal existence without the presence of God where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't pray for our loved ones enough who aren't saved. We don't earnestly encourage them to see God, to accept salvation. If we really believed 
that by not accepting Christ, it would equal eternal dam damnation, I think we would never stop preaching the gospel. We would never stop. Whenever we had any extra time, we would be eager because we know, we know that a life without the presence of God in and of itself would be torture. But then it's going to be layered with fire and brimstone and pain. Do not turn away from your salvation at all costs at all costs. Our hearts should be broken at the thought that our loved ones do not know the Lord, that they have not accepted salvation. Our hearts should break daily for them as God's heart breaks daily for them. Lord, I pray that we have a greater passion to see those around us saved. The seventh condition to consider is faith in Christ as our crucified and risen Savior and Lord is the cause of salvation. Let's take a look at John 3. 15 through 21. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Faith in Christ is the cause of your salvation. Nothing else. It's faith. However, it must be noted that faith assumes genuine repentance. That is followed by genuine obedience. What is faith if you have nothing to show for it? If you have no fruit? Your faith can be reasonably questioned if you're not if you don't eventually become a better person after accepting Jesus Christ. That is just a part of obedience. That's just a part of faith. If you genuinely believed that Jesus died on the cross, you will think about the choices you make a lot more. Faith without works is dead. Show me a life where someone is living for the Lord, loving people, not sinning, and then I know they have faith. And then you have someone who is sitting there, cussing, sleeping around, doing things that they know the Lord has guided them to not do. And then I'm like, they don't have faith. If they truly believed that God is, the, Jesus is the Son of God, they would know that Jesus is inside of them and will help them not do those things. Again, faith without works is dead. The eighth condition to consider is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
cooperate with the sinner in his salvation. It's all four. There's some, some people who believe that it's just all God who saves someone. But we believe that um, there has to be free will of the person to accept it. That God doesn't just force it on you. You have to be saved. No, the person has to accept it. I, I want to. It's almost like God gave a gift card of salvation and you have to use it. Amen. You have to use it. it. It's just, that's how it works. And it's not, God's not going to force you to swipe the card, the gift card, for it to be used. No, he gave, he gave it to you. You have to redeem it. You have to use it. So the father draws the sinner, the son paid the price, and the Holy Spirit convicts the sinner. This is the process of salvation. The father draws the sinner, the son already paid the price, so he made it available, and the Holy Spirit convicts the sinner of the sins. And the sinner accepts and becomes born of the Spirit or born again. Let's take a look at 2 Peter 1.4. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. God has made us partakers of the divine nature through the death on the cross. But we have to be partakers. We have to partake of it. Again, it's not going to force you to be saved. Even though he already knows who will be saved and who won't, he still allows life to happen, and whoever chooses to be saved will be saved. He's not picking and choosing who's going to be saved and who's not. He doesn't already like, oh, the people are going to go to hell. I already wanted them to go to hell. No. No. He didn't create those people to go to hell. Christ died for everyone. Everyone. The next, so that concludes the eight conditions that are good to understand about salvation. Next is the evidences of salvation. There are both inward and outward evidences of salvation. And I think we've all seen this. We've all seen someone get saved, and you, you can see that when the burdens are inwardly lifted, most feel an unexplainable joy. When your sins are forgiven, when you know you are set free, most cannot help but express a sense of peace, a sense of joy, and a sense of love. They are often overflowing with these. Peace, joy, and love. The first three fruits of the Spirit. You can already see the evidences of the first three fruits of the Spirit the moment they get saved. Even though these are subjective emotions, this is a steer, still clear evidence that something powerful has taken place inside of that person. That, that it is very likely that they have been changed. When you see these evidence of genuine joy, genuine love, genuine peace, you know, oh my goodness, this person has experienced something so real, so powerful, that they're going to be changed. Another, another inward evidence is that the Holy Spirit has come into them. And you can already tell that God, the Holy Spirit is guiding their decisions, even just right after. So I already touched on this before a little bit, but there must be outward evidence of salvation. It is demonstrated by obedience to the word and the will of God. 
It is by living a life of holiness by the power of the Holy Spirit. They no longer sin. Christ has broken the curse and the power of sin over your life over addiction, over fear, over so many things, then you should act like it. Christ has broken the curse of addiction, of sin over your life. For some people, they're instantly right there. And You can sense the sins have broken off of them immediately. They're no longer an alcoholic. They're no longer uh, watching porn. They're no longer doing all these different things. But there are some people who do take take a slower process, but the thing is is that they're daily working on it, allowing the Holy Spirit to break them daily and die daily over and over and over again. We all would love the first one, but sometimes it takes that next step. Sometimes it takes the slower process, and that's okay. It's not that you're less of a Christian. It's not that you're less of a Christian if that happens. It must be demonstrated by allowing Christ to live through us and empower us for the service of the kingdom. If you truly have faith, the Lord will slowly show you who to talk to. He's going to equip you on how to reach other people. He's going to show you how to share the gospel. He's going to show you and guide you on how to love other people, the people that are hard to love. Let's take a look at 1 John 2.5. But whoever keeps his word, God's commandments, In him, truly, the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Let's take a look at John 14 and 15. If you love me, this is Jesus saying this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And let's take a look at 1 John 2, 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So anyone who is sinning, lying, doing all these different things, lusting, again, looking at pornography, gossiping, stealing, cheating, cheating on their taxes, (laughs) it is very reasonable for you to question whether they're saved. And you're not being judgy. You're not being judgy. You're just doing what God has called you to do to keep that person accountable and let them know. If if they're continually doing that, it's letting them know you aren't saved. If, again, the, the reason why I'm talking about pornography is that I think some studies have shown that 90% of American men are addicted to pornography or at least occasionally look at it. That's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. Such a huge amount of men. And then the percentages of women who are looking at it are increasing as well because it's so available. And so if 90% are, and it's a crucial part, that that's a clear sin in the Bible, are we supposed to say that all of them aren't Christians? It's one thing if they're struggling and they're working through it, you know, they're working through it. But I think it's so important to understand whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We must lay down even the hardest addictions, the hardest sins, and lay them down to Christ. So this was my presentation on the salvation of man. And um, it, again, it's important to know those eight conditions for salvation. And there has to be clear evidence, clear evidence for your salvation. If, if you have nothing to show for it, it's reasonable for people to question your salvation. And they shouldn't, they shouldn't be offended because 
they're not saved, <laughs> you know? So I'll pass this to Brother Jim. You know, I, I was thinking uh, with her illustration of the sliding the credit card. There is no expiration. <laughs> Isn't that great? We have. Aren't you glad for your salvation? Amen. And Amy, you really hit it on the head. I think many times we, I don't know if it's forget or maybe get too busy to pray for those that we know do not know the Lord. And I was sitting here thinking, it's just almost, well, not almost, I was feeling convicted, you know, for different ones. And, and I don't know if you just maybe get tired of it or weary, or is it going to happen anyway? I mean, you know, uh, that sometimes you just, but it, you have to be careful not to buy into that. You have to be careful not to buy into that. So I think as we close tonight, I think <laughs> I would like to focus on those that we know that don't know the Lord in our prayer time. And as you come around the altars or, or in your seat, wherever you feel comfortable, I believe you need to call out their name to the Lord. Uh, there's sometimes, you know, uh, my my studio is my study and I'm downstairs most of the time. I don't study in my office at the church. It's so much easier just to go downstairs. And, uh, and so I just do that. And there's times where I've got a missions board. If you've ever been down in my studio, I've got a big threefold thing. And it's half filled with missionaries and people that I know and list and as I pray. And I... Sometimes I just speak their name out. I just call their name out. And I say, Jesus, touch, and I just call them by name. Touch their heart. Minister to them. Draw them. But then I have to remember, too, uh, that I'm the example before them. And Amy said it as she was wrapping up that the outward we see something happening in someone's life. So we have to be the model before them. That makes it even tougher, doesn't it? Because now when I pray for that person, I'm really praying for me <laughs> so that others see Jesus in me. So tonight I'm going to give you a twofold reason to pray. Number one, pray for that person who doesn't know the Lord. And number two, pray for yourself that Lord I be the example before others because most of my relatives that don't know the Lord don't live here they don't live close to me but someone has to be an example somewhere for them and maybe I'm the very one that they're praying for here for their family or their friend and now I have to be an example for them because it kind of works that way so as we pray tonight just let's call out their name before the Lord and just pray James 5 the fervent prayer of a white, righteous person availeth much the word of availeth means accomplishes much it means we push forward we, we, we are pushing so let's push forward as we pray just claim them in the name of Jesus I've been reading a book and as soon as I get it completed you'll get a couple sermons on it and it's teaching you how to pray. It's, sometimes we just pray so-called prayers, but we need, to, we need to be more forceful in our prayers. And, I, and I've been really relating to the book. The writer's really good. One of my favorite writers. And, and I thought, yeah, I need to be forceful. In the name of Jesus touched their heart. It's the name of Jesus. It's Jesus that touches their heart. I, I can't do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I can only be a messenger. You can only be a messenger. So I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal, but that only dismisses you to come find a place to pray. And when you're done praying, when you just feel like you're ready to go home, then go home. And uh, 
You stay till midnight, I'll stay with you. I've done that a few times. I've gone past the midnight hour a few times. And I wouldn't mind doing it again. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for a powerful message. And thank you for the gift of salvation and the clarity that Amy brought tonight. That it's so important that we understand that salvation is for everyone. It's for, for us, Lord God. That uh, it's, it's been paid for by the blood, the sacrifice, by the risen Savior, by the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I've been grafted into that family. Oh, God, I'm so thankful that I have eternal value to my life. And someday I'll, I'll stand before my Lord. And I just thank you that I'll have that opportunity. So Lord, go with us as we go tonight. Just guide us safely home and keep us safe. And we'll just thank you for it, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Amen.